I'm good. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. What a great day it is to worship the Lord. Amen. He has given us a beautiful day to worship <laughs> Him. And we are so thankful and for the privilege that we have yes. to be able to come together in the house of the Lord and worship Him. Yes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and praise as we come into this place. Yes. My Lord God of heaven, we want to worship you today and honor you as we come into this place today. Lord God of heaven, because in our praise and in our worship, your spirit dwells. And my Lord God, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And my Lord God of heaven, we want to release whatever you need to do this morning into this place. Touch every heart, touch every life, minister to needs. My God of heaven, see people saved, delivered, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, and healed, oh Lord God, and so much more. Whatever you want to do in this service today, Lord, we are open and we're willing and we're receptive to you as we worship you and as we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So good morning. When this light is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. together with him in the air whether you're living whether you're dying the bible said those graves are going to burst open and we'll meet jesus in the air hallelujah glory to god a country Yeah. 
thing like you and I have seen things, but if they've given their heart to him, one day they're going to, first thing they're going to see is they're going to see the face of Jesus. Yeah. My, 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 my. And that don't make you want to shout. Yeah. Hey, you, 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 you. Oh, I'm here to tell you, there's something not right because I get excited when I get to thinking about seeing Jesus, when I get to thinking about being with him and living with him and reviving with him throughout yes. eternity. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, come on, Jesus. Let this be the day. Yes. Let this be the day. Oh, friend, let me tell you, I have a lot of stuff to cover this morning, and there's no way that I can say everything that could be said that about this subject in one setting. And I'm not going to try to rush, Amen. but at the same time, I'm not going to try to drag it out either. So bear with me this morning as I yield myself to the Holy Spirit of yes, God hallelujah. and let the Holy Ghost speak what he yes. wants spoken in this place this morning. Yes, Lord. You hear me often speak about the rapture of the church, yes. about the catching away that's yes. about to take place. And I fear in my heart that some people have heard this so much that their ears have grown Deaf to the hearing. Yes. And they become desensitized yes. to what is being said. And oh well, you're the preacher, and that's just preacher talk, and that's just something that you're supposed to say. My friend, let me tell you, it's not something that I'm supposed to say. It's something that I say this morning that has a twofold meaning behind it. Number one, for the child of God, for the redeemed, for those that are born again. I say it to, to remind you like one of the songs that we sang this morning. This trial of life is just about over. All the heartache, all the pain, all the suffering, all the sorrow, all the sadness, all the gloom and yes. gloom and despair is just about over. We're about to get caught up in the presence of the Lord. Yes. My friend, where there's going to be no heartache, there's going to be no sorrow, there's going to be no pain, there's going to be no suffering. That's right. Hallelujah. And for those who are on the other side of the coin, who have rejected Jesus, I say this with a broken heart as a warning, as a warning to get ready yes. because he's coming. Yes, amen. And he's coming soon. Yes. Scripture tells us that one day real soon that we're about to see the Lord himself that's going to descend from heaven with a shout. Hallelujah. With the voice of the archangel and with the yes. trumpet of God. Hallelujah. And the word says that dead in Christ is going to rise up first. And then we which are alive and remaining are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Yes. And he said, so shall we ever be with the Lord. I can't think of a better place to be yes. than to be with the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. I believe what Luke recorded in Acts 1 and 11 when he said this same Jesus, this same Jesus yes. that was taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as you seen him go from heaven. How did he get, how did he get taken up, preacher? The word tells us in verse 9 that he a cloud received him out of their sight. In other words, he left here on a cloud and he's coming back on a cloud. Yes. Praise Hallelujah. God forevermore. I do believe that cloud that Jesus is coming back on is being prepared, already ready. They're already gassed up, fueled up. They're all, my friend, ready to come and gather the elect from the four corners of the world. Yes, amen. I also believe that every eye is going to see. Yes. Revelation 1 tells us that in verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. 
My friend, let me tell you, you say, well, preacher, how can that happen? With man, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. My friend, let me tell you, there's a day coming where we're going to hear a sound. And it's going to be a sound of a trumpet blast. And it's going to gain the attention of the world. And as we look to that sound, we're going to see Jesus on the cloud of glory coming together his elect from the four corners of the earth. Hallelujah forevermore. Yes, hallelujah. When he comes on that cloud, he's going to make a statement. He's going to make a declaration. Something to the effect that he did on the day that he stood at the tomb of Lazarus. Remember when he stood there at the tomb of Lazarus that day and he declared, Lazarus, come forth. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Lazarus come out of that tomb. After four days, he had been in the grave, but he come out, my friend, in his grave clothes. My friend, let me tell you, I believe with all of my heart on that day that I'm talking about when we hear the sound of the trumpet and we hear the voice of Jesus Christ. He may be, I don't know what his exact words will be, but I believe it'll be something like, Bride, come forth. Bride, come forth. Bride, come forth. Oh, I want to tell you something, my friend. Then it's going to take place what we read about a while ago, when the dead in Christ are going to rise up, and then we which are alive and remaining are going to be caught up together with him. Yes, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now, I've heard it said that those that were taken up, there may just be a pile of clothes where they were standing at the time. Maybe a hearing aid or a, a, a set of false teeth. Glasses. Glasses. Yes. Yeah. It may be a pacemaker yes. or a defibrillator. All those things that we have to put on in this life. In this life. Yes. There's going to be a pile of them right there. Yes. Hallelujah. Because we're not going to need them anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. We're not going to need them anymore. Hallelujah. Oh, the word of God tells us that this corruptible body is going to put on incorruption. In other words, those things that defile us, those things that hinder us, those heart problems, uh, those eye problems, uh, those ear problems. Uh, oh, my friend, all those problems that are in this life, uh, we're going to leave them behind. Yes, this old hallelujah. corruptible body is going to put on incorruption. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Thank you, I've heard it since the graves of those that rose up were burst open. Yes. Now, I don't know. I can't find those exact words in Scripture. But I do, do believe it is a possibility because I do believe that there will be an outward, visible, physical sign that the dead in Christ have risen. Yes, amen. Just like the day when Jesus come out of the tomb, what happened that day? The stone was rolled away. My friends are revealed the empty tomb. Yes. When the dead in Christ shall rise, it is a great possibility. My friend, let me tell you, oh, great God Almighty, it is a great possibility that the graves are going to burst open and it's going to reveal the empty grave. It's going to be a sign for this world to see that the dead in Christ, those grandmas and grandpas, those moms and dads, those dear old saints of God that have walked with him until their final breath. My friend, all of a sudden, they're going to be resurrected in his image yes, and in his life. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The word said we're going to be raised and we're going to be changed. Yes. Oh my. Hallelujah. You're absolutely right, Sister Mary, in a twinkling of an eye. Yes. It's going to happen so fast, people ain't going to have to say, hey, I have time to say Jesus. That's right. You hear me? Mm -hmm. It's going to happen so fast, you ain't going to have time to say Jesus. You're going to hear it, you're going to see it, you're going to know it, and it's gone. Yes. It's done happening. Yes. Oh, well, that raises the question then, Pastor. What's going to happen after the rapture? 
What's going to take place after the rapture? Can I tell you that depends on whether you go in the cloud or whether you're left behind. Yes. Hear me. That all depends what you have to look forward to, what you can expect, what you can anticipate, what you can plan on, what you can bank on. Yes. It depends on whether you go in the cloud with Jesus or you're left behind. That's right. Amen. See, for those that go in the cloud, for those that when he says, bride, come forth, and gravity turns a loose of your body, and you began to rise up incorruptible, immortal, in a glorified body. My friend, let me tell you, Revelation chapters 4 and 5 poured a picture to us of worship that takes place in yes, heaven. Hallelujah. It talks about a throne room. It talks about not just a throne room, but the throne room. The throne room of a, of a mighty God where there's angelic hosts and angelic creatures and angelic beings that are worshiping around the throne. That's where we're going. That's where we're headed. Yes, we're hallelujah. headed to the presence of God Almighty to yes. spend time in his presence worshiping yes, him. Hallelujah. Can I tell you that there's a lot of things that I hear mentioned taking place in heaven. Some of it I don't find in scripture. But I'm not here this morning to argue the finer points of that. don't have time. But one thing I do find in scripture is that we're going to be worshiping yes. around the throne of God. Yes. We worship him afar down here. We come to this place this morning. We get up early. We come, we take our showers. We clean ourselves up. We put up, we brush our teeth, wash our face, do all our stuff, get everything. We come to the house of, of God and we worship him. We wear and oh my friend, let me tell you, I can feel his presence in this place this morning as we praise him and as we worship him. But it's nothing like that it's gonna be on that day. My friend, let me tell you, when we are in his direction presence uh, and we are worshiping him together with multitude, multitude, multitude of millions and billions of saints uh, that yes. have gathered together around yes. the throne room of God to praise yes. and worship yes. him Hallelujah. and forevermore. Yes, Glory. Hallelujah. Now for those who worship doesn't mean anything down here. If it doesn't motivate you and if it doesn't excite you and it doesn't mean anything for you to worship down here, I'm not trying to be mean spirited, but you're probably not going to be there. So you're not going to have anything to worry about. But I want to tell you, if you love worship, yes. and you love being in the presence of the Lord, yeah, yeah. and you love honoring the Lord, yes, and you love praising the Lord, and you love giving him glory, oh, my yeah. friend, let me tell you, you're going to be right there, and you're going to be right at home yes. in his presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, in Revelation chapter 6, we begin to see the first of 21 judgments that God is going to pour out upon those who are left behind. Yes. Why would he do that? Because they rejected Christ. Mm -hmm. They rejected the cross. They rejected the plan of salvation. They rejected the word. They rejected the church. They rejected everything that God stood for, that everything God has tried to do for them in their life. They have stood in defiance. They have stood in opposition. They have stood in, 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 in disobedience. And because they have rejected God and God's way, my friend, let me tell you, they are about to face the wrath of an angry God. Yes. Yes, amen. Let me tell you something. We began to read in verse 2. And we've heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And the first one is the white horse. This speed, and on the white horse, he has a crown. Though the, the rider of this horse 
has a crown given him. He went forth conquering and to conquer. This is speaking of the Antichrist. This is speaking of the Antichrist. Sometimes after the rapture of the church takes place, a demon-possessed madman with a hunger for power and a hunger to control the world is going to get behind a podium someplace. He's going to have a, an answer to the problems that right. plague society. Right. We hear a lot about AI today, okay? Artificial intelligence. And it troubles me on one hand that, that, that because used in the right way, AI can be good. But it also has the potential of evil. Yes. Let me give you an example, just one little scenario of how the Antichrist can use AI to trick the world. AI is artificial intelligence is a mass of computers that they're programming, that they're building right now, that are supercomputers that have the greatest intellect and the intelligence that the world has ever known. So great, one of these computers has even taught itself the Portuguese language. No one programmed it. No one told it how to speak it, how to pronounce it, how to write it. This computer on its own taught itself this language. That's how sophisticated they're getting. This madman comes to a podium with an earbud in his ear that no one can see. And one poses a question to him, Sir, well, what are you going to do about this? How to solve this problem? And behind the scenes, someone quickly types this into a keyboard, and these computers go to work, and in just a matter of a few seconds, they spit out an answer. And that person at the keyboard speaks, whispers this in this earbud. And he comes out of his mouth. And it's going to make, wow. That makes so much sense. Why didn't I think of it? And the world is going to embrace him as the smartest man in the world. Yeah. They're going to begin to look to him yeah. as God. Yeah. They're going to begin to recognize him as being having the same characteristics and the same nature and the same wisdom as God. And they're going to usher him into power and control. That's right. Now these next three horsemen, these next three are coming simultaneously. Wham, wham, wham. Together are so close together that it's, that it's, that it's, it, it's almost like they're on top of one another. The next one is we talked about is the, the horse that was red. The horse that was red, there was power given to him to take peace from the earth. See, because when this madman, the Antichrist, comes to power, one of the first things he's going to do is he's going to develop a peace plan that's going to bring peace to the earth for a very short period of time. The nations of the world. This thing that's going on between Russia and, 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 and Afghanistan right now, that's going to be resolved. Ukraine. Sure, Ukraine, you're right, thank you. That's going to be resolved. They'll come up with a solution to make both parties happy. The gang wars that we hear about in our city streets, they'll stop. Things are going to, there's going to be peace. Even the religions of the world that fight with one another, there's going to be a peace between them. So, but how do you know that? Because the word tells us how that, that how that the temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, and the Muslims already control the area where the temple will be built in this area. But he's going to come up with a plan, and he's going to the, that the Jewish temple will be rebuilt, and the the Old Testament sacrifices will be once again be offered on the altar right. in this temple That's what the word says. to bring peace. And for a season of about three and a half years, there's going to be peace 
on earth. Oh, I don't have time to go into it this morning, but can I tell you that the, 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 the cornerstone for that temple is already loaded on an 18-wheeler getting ready to be put in place? Can I tell you that, the, that there are red heifers, purebred red heifers yes. that are being raised right now, yes. that, are be, that, that are being planned to be used at the sacrifice at that temple? Yes. Can I tell you that they're training, that they're training Levitical priesthood people that to, 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 to do the office and to sacrifice the way that, that, that they did back in the Old Testament? That's how close we are to yes. And in about three and a half years, all of a sudden, this madman is going to step into the temple and to desecrate and defile the temple. Most Bible scholars feel like he's going to try to offer a pig on the altar. Mm. And at that time, he, his true colors are going to be revealed. And when his true colors are revealed, all of a sudden, the false peace that the world has known is going to end. Bloodshed is going to take place. Yeah. Peace is going to leave this earth. People are going to kill one another. Many are going to die. Oh, my friend, by, because of warfare and fighting. Then we see the black horse. Here we read, while on the black horse, the man has a pair of balances in his hand. And with these, and then he talks about it in the next verse, how that a measure of wheat will go for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. What this is speaking to us is a world famine that's about to take place. Yes. During this time of when the, after the peace agreement has been broken, and the World War III is broken out, and the world is at war once again, there is going to be such a shortage of food when it's talking about the balances and all these things in these verses that I don't have a lot of time to expound on this morning. What it's talking about is food is going to be so short and so scarce that a man and woman will have to work all day long just to make enough money to buy enough flour to make a loaf of bread for yes. that day. One loaf of bread. Yes. Just enough fathers no longer will be able to, to feed their families. Mothers will no longer be able to feed their families. Luxuries like electric lights, water, gas, sewer, gasoline for your car to get back and forth to work, medical expenses, anything other than that, because everything, and that is God's word, that's speaking this. You hear what I'm saying? And we'll never go again, never be able to surpass what God has said is going to come to pass. That's right. It will. Everything you can rake and scrape together for one day's wage, just enough to buy you enough meal to make a loaf of bread for that day. Yes. That's coming. Oh, I want to tell you something, though. There are those today that think, well, you know, I'm smart enough. I'll just store up my food. I've heard people tell me this. I'll store up food. I'll go buy a piece of property and I'll make sure I've got water on it and I'll make sure I've got this and I'll make sure I've got that. I'll grow me a garden and I'll do all this stuff. I'll get by. My friend, let me tell you, you better fall on your face and repent because you're not smart enough, you're not wise enough, and you're not nothing enough to go against what God said is going to happen. Because during this time of great famine, this time of great shortage, can I tell you the crime rate is probably going to escalate. People are going to be, they're going to do whatever they have to do to get food for them, to eat for themselves and their families. They'll rob, they'll steal, they'll loot, they'll kill if they have to. That's right. Jackie's daddy used to tell us when he was a boy growing up during the Depression, when there was nothing during the depression. He said, we'd lay there at night and look out the window, and he said, we'd see people slipping through the, through the woods to get into our barn. Because he said, we had a few taters in the barn, maybe a little corn in the barn, maybe a little something else in the barn. And they were hungry because they didn't have anything. 
And he said, we didn't try to stop them because he said we knew they were hungry. Yes. My friend, let me tell you something. The Great Depression of the past and the Sunday school picnic compared to what the Word of God is yes. talking is fixing to happen in the yes. future. And don't you think you can hoard up food? Because I'm going to tell you something. With no electricity, your refrigerator and your freezer are going to go out. Mm-hmm. Hello? There ain't going to be no gas for your generator to run a generator on. Oh, you know, and, and you begin to, we begin to get deeper into this. There's going to be things that are going to happen to where root cellars and all these things aren't going to work. Nothing you can do is going to help you surpass what God has spoken is going to happen. And that's just the beginning. Then he began to talk about the last horse of the apocalypse. A pale horse, a greenish pale horse, and the one that sat on him was called Death, and Hell followed. Now let's look at this for just a minute. Let's look at this for just a minute, okay? What is death? When the Bible talks about death, It's not just talking about the absence of life. When the Bible speaks of death, most of the time it's speaking about being pushed, driven, separated from the presence of God. Amen. Remember what happened when in the Garden of Eden? When God told Adam, as soon as you if you eat that fruit of that tree, you're going to die? What happened to Adam? When he took the fruit, he didn't die physically. Oh, later he did, but he didn't die physically. But what happened? He was separated from the presence of yes, God. Yes, he was. When the Bible is speaking of death, many times that's what it's talking about. And then after death, hell followed. Death is a separation of God. What is hell? Hell is the eternal punishment of God for those who reject him. Yes. What are you saying, preacher? Those that die after the rapture, before the millennial reign, during this period of time known as the tribulation period, will be eternally separated from the presence of God and suffer the punishment of the devil's hell. That's the word of God. Yes. I've heard people say, oh, well, when the mark of the beast comes, I just won't give, I just won't give in to it, and I'll let them cut my head off. Then you'll be eternally separated from the presence of God, suffering in the devil's hell. That's the word of God. Then it goes on to say that power was given to him. Power was given to him that over one-fourth of the earth that he'll kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of the earth. Hear me. In this one judgment right here, one-fourth of the population of the world will be affected by acts of warfare, by acts of violence, by starvation, by natural causes, and even by wild animal attack. Have you noticed in recent years how the wild animals that used to stay far and far and far away from humans now have started getting closer and closer? How many have ever seen a mountain lion, a panther? Jackie and I saw one sitting on a deer stand one day. And the scary thing about it was from where we were sitting, if I looked in the right direction, just over the tops of the trees, I could see houses very close. And that's how close that panther was to those homes. For years, they shied away from people and run. Now they're getting, I've seen it on Facebook where people have looked out their patio and seen panthers in their backyard and bears and other creatures. What are you saying? It just shows you 
nature's getting ready. Things are getting ready for the word of God to be fulfilled. Things that are going to happen after the rapture. In verse 12, he talks about a great earthquake that's going to take place. In verse 13, he talks about how the stars of heaven, probably most Bible scholars feel it, talk about meteorites here that are going to fall onto the earth. So much are going to take place. Natural disasters are going to be so, so strong. Things are going to happen that the, that the very landscape of the earth itself is going to change. Yes. Between the earthquakes and the meteorites, the mountains will be moved. The landscape of the world is going to change. Remember what I talked a while ago about people trying to hide food in the root cellar? It's going to cave in. Hello? You'll never outsmart God. Verses 15 tells us that the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who is able to stand? My friend, let me tell you, people are going to wake up and they're going to recognize and they're going to realize what's taking place. But it's going to be too late. Remember Noah and the ark? 120 years Noah built the ark and he was a preacher of righteousness that he preached and warned the people and told the people of what was going to take place. Yes. They laughed at him, they mocked him, they ignored him, called him an old fool and whatever and, 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 and just let, went on by about their business. There come a day where God shut the door of the ark yes. and God sealed it. That's the word. Look it yes, up. He did. And all of a sudden the rain, something it had never done before, had never rained before this day. Suddenly the heavens opened and the rain began to fall. And those folks began to look up and say, hmm, what's that? And all of a sudden this rain was up to their ankles. And this rain got up to their knees. This rain got up to their waist. But wait a minute, that old crazy man might have had something there. That old crazy man might have known what he was talking about. And can you see it in your mind's eye? That, uh, that all of a sudden they rush up to the ark as the water's getting up about their chest. They're rushing up to the ark and they're banging on the side of the ark. Hey, Noah, let us in. Hey, Noah, let us in. Hey, Noah, let us in. But it was too late. Yes. They had ignored God's call when they had the chance. Yes. But he shut the door and he sealed it. And the rains came. His judgment started. And he didn't stop right in the middle of his judgment, did he? It's a sad thing. Many are going to recognize. Many are going to realize. Many are going to know what took place. Those that have sat in church services that have heard this preached and ignored it. Those that sat in the Sunday school class and have heard it and ignored it. Those who maybe have even one time themselves preached it or taught it themselves and then discounted it and went back to living for the world rather than living for God. They are going to know what's taking place, but it's going to be too late. Amen. There's nothing they can do about it. Then the next thing we read about is how there's going to be hail and fire that's going to hit the ground. Hail and fire mingle with blood. And here we see one third of the trees are going to be burned up. Now, let me tell you something. Picture this if you would, okay? Because sometimes when we get to reading this, we don't, it, it, we, 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 we read through it so fast that we don't, we don't let it soak in. With the earthquakes, 
and the meteorites and all the things that are going on, the air is going to be filled with smoke from the fires that's going to be burning. And from the ash and from all the pollutants that's going to be in the air. You know, they're talking right now. How many have heard on the news the last the last week last few weeks? They're having wildfires in Canada right now, but the smoke from them wildfires is in Arkansas. Have you heard them talking about that on the news? I have. Can you imagine with all the things that are going to be taking place, the air is going to be filled with all manner of debris that is going to affect what we see, what we hear, what we breathe. Okay? One third of the trees are going to be burning. Now, trees have a threefold purpose. Trees have a threefold purpose. Purpose number one is a food source for man and beast. Many of the things we get, our fruits and some of them you know, that we enjoy, the nuts that we enjoy, they come from trees. Not only does it trees feed man, they feed nature. We're already had a famine. We're already food is scarce. So don't think you're going to run out to the apple tree and get apples because apples ain't going to be there. Not only that, trees purify the air. They breathe in pollutants and omit pure air. With all the toxins in the air, you take away a third of the trees on top of what they're already setting down. There's no way to purify the air. The air is going to be thick. Yes. And then the trees provide shelter. And that's not to mention the grass. The word says all the green grass. All the green grass is burned up. What's going to happen when you take the grass away? The world will become a dust bowl. Any breeze is going to stir up a cloud of dust. Walking across the ground is going to stir up a cloud of dust. Compile that with all the other things that are going on. And the, 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 the air is going to be thick. We think we have sinus problems now. We haven't seen anything yet. Can I tell you what? That's not the end of it. The next thing we read about is there's going to be a catastrophe that's going to take place to where one third of a sea is going to become contaminated with blood. One third of the sea is going to become contaminated with blood. And as a result of that, one third of the sea life the marine life are going to die. Can you imagine what kind of mess it's going to be when all of a sudden whales and sharks and all the other fish in the ocean began to come to the surface because they died and their skin, they began to rot and began to stink and all the things that's going to take place there. Disease and germs is going to fill the air. And not only with that, he said a third part of the ships are going to be destroyed. The navies of the world are going to lose a part of their navy. The cargo ships that transport cargo from one nation to the other are going to lose part of their cargo ships. And instead, they're going to be destroyed. That leads me to think that they may be dis they, they, they may sink. They may be like like it, like ships during the war. They've been hit with a torpedo or something. And all the fuel and all the oils and all the cargo that's in there are going to be spewed into the ocean, which is going to further contaminate the waters of the ocean. And it's just it's going to magnify and intensify the problem. It's going to wreak havoc on the ecosystem of the, of the sea life. 
But that's not all. Immediately following that, there's going to be a judgment poured out upon a third part of the fresh water. Rivers and ponds and streams are fresh resource. And a third part of the fresh water of the world is going to become so bitter that we're unable to drink it. Oh, I want to tell you something. As a result, man and beast alike, many will die because of dehydration. Because they don't have enough water to keep their bodies hydrated. This is the judgments of God. Then he talks about how that a third part of the sun and a third part of the moon and a third part of the stars all of our natural light is going to grow dim. A third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars are going to go out. All of a sudden, all this solar technology that they've got right now, all these solar panels and all this solar stuff that they've got going on that they, they draw from the sun, well, they're going to be affected by all the stuff that's going to be in the atmosphere to start with, but when you lose a third or part of the light, of the sun and the moon and the stars, they're going to be rendered useless. That's right. Compile that on top of all the pollutants that are in the air, the dust and all these things we've been talking about thus far. It's just going to be worse and worse and worse. Then he talks about in the next one where a star falls from heaven. And he was given a key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there came a smoke out of the pit. And the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Intensifying what I've been talking about. And out of this smoke was going to come a locust upon the earth. And his power had given them to sting a man as a scorpion stings a man. They're not going to touch the trees or the grass. They're coming after those that are here. The word says they'll be tormented. Those that are bitten by these will be tormented five months in misery and in pain. The pain of these scorpions is going to be so great on the top of everything else that's taking place, on top of all this other that's happening, men are going to seek death. Men are going to wish to die. Many are going to want to die. Many of may even try to commit suicide. They're going to beg to die. But they're, no, they're not going to be able to. We find then where the angel sounds and hears a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And he said to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river of Euphrates. And they saw them in the vision, and there was the sight that the breastplate of fire, and of up and the brimstone, and the heads of the horses were the heads of fire, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And a third part of men, third part of the inhabitants of the earth will be killed by fire, killed by smoke, and killed by the brimstone. Once again, the sad thing is, we talked about a while ago, people recognizing and realizing that this was a judgment of God. But man's heart has become so hard. Man's heart has become so vile, so angry. But they would not repent. They would not even then say, God, 
I'm sorry for what they had done. Now that's what's going on here on earth. Okay? That's what's going to be taking place here on earth. But up in heaven, wow. Up in heaven, while there is hell on earth, if you'll pardon the expression, taking place here, up in heaven, there's going to be a celebration known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. A time of jubilee. A time of celebration. A time of you know, the marriage supper in the Jewish, if you understand Jewish tradition, they're Jewish. But man, when they had a marriage, it wasn't just a, a, an hour ordeal or a 10 minute. It was a week long festival and a week long feast. And they had food on top of food on top of food. And they had music and they had entertainment and they had celebration and they did everything they could to live it up. Well, my friend, let me tell you why they're going to be things going on down on earth for those that rejected Christ now while up in heaven you've got multitudes of multitudes of billions of saints that are going to be sitting around the, the table of the marriage supper of the Lamb and they're going to be celebrating they're going to be they're going to be they're going to be laughing and they're going to be having the time of their life because they have been found worthy. Can I tell you, they're all at that time, they're going to sit up here before the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible talks about the books. Can I tell you, God's a good record keeper. He knows all. He sees all. He hears all. Every prayer that these saints have prayed, He's got it written down. Every tear they've ever shed, he's got it written down. Every time they went to church, he's got it written down. Every time they did, they invited people to church, he's got it written down. Every time they done everything, anything for the sake of the gospel, he's got it written down. And at the judgment, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, they're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to begin to, to call you up, and he's going to begin, my friend, to, to say, hey, I remember here and here and here when you did this, and you did this, and you did this, and he's going to begin to pay, give you your crown. He's going to begin to lay that crown on your head. Oh, oh my friend, let me tell you, Crowns represent the rewards that the believers are going to receive at the marriage supper after living a life of faithfulness, after living a life of dedication, after living a life of Christ-likeness. My friend, enduring things that they had to endure here on this earth to be what they had to be in Christ Jesus. They're going to know it'll be worth it after all. It'll be worth it, my friend, when you stand in his presence. My friend Paul talked about him. Uh, Second Timothy, about that being a crown of righteousness. Uh, my friend, let me tell you, he's going to lay it, he's going to give you a reward of his righteousness. Uh, James talked about it being a crown of life. Uh, and Peter talked about it being a crown of glory that never fades. Uh, he's got a crown with your name on it. Yes. Uh, if your name has been written in the Lamb Book of Life Hallelujah. and you make the rapture, he's got a crown with your name on it uh, that he personally is going to lay on your head. Yes. Hallelujah. Bow your head with me this morning. I ask you this this morning because this is only a choice that you can make. When the rapture takes place, would you rather go be with Jesus in the presence of God, yes. in the presence of angels, yes. at a time of celebration, at a time of rejoicing, or had you rather be left behind to go through the things of the tribulation? See, many 
people today like to gamble. And I'll be truthful. There are going to be a few. I personally feel like it will be very few. But there are going to be a few that somehow they're going to manage to make it through the tribulation. Somehow they're going to manage. I don't know. I don't know how many. But I do know there'll be a few. And gambling has become a million dollar a year industry in America these days. People love to gamble. It gets in their blood. But can I tell you a truth about gambling? For those that gamble, you lose much more than you ever win. You might hit a jackpot every now and then. You might get a little token every now and then. But you begin to add it up. And you lose much more than you ever win. Are you a gambler? See, living for Christ is no gamble. When you live for Christ and the trumpet sounds, you know where you're going. And you don't have to worry about all this stuff I've been talking about this morning. Rejecting Christ is nothing but a gamble. Are you willing to gamble that you'll make it? Are you willing to gamble that I can make it through without any of this stuff affecting me and harming me? If the rapture was to take place right now, would you go or would you be left behind? While your head is bowed, the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart right now. The Holy Spirit's whispering in your ear right now. Only you know for sure the answer to that question. But dear friend, let me tell you this morning, if there's any doubt whatsoever in your heart, don't gamble. Don't take a chance. Don't run the risk. If there's any doubt whatsoever in your heart that should the trumpet sound right now and Jesus cry out, Bride, come forth right now that you might not know. I want to meet you at the cross. I want you to get up this morning and come meet me at the foot of the cross. Because we want to pray with you and we want to make sure that she'll, whenever the rapture takes place, that you're ready to go to be with Christ, not left behind. How about it this morning? How about it? If you're not sure, will you meet me at the cross? Don't worry about what anybody's going to think, what anybody's going to say. Your eternity is far more important than somebody else's thoughts and opinions. Are you ready?
sound of my voice. If you're not sure that you're going to make it, if you're not sure that if a trumpet sounds and the rapture takes place that you won't be left behind, I want to pray with you right now as well. I want to pray that the Lord of glory touch your heart and save your soul. Pray with me right now, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all my wrong. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I surrender all to you. In Jesus' name. Just that simple, just that simple prayer, you changed your eternal destiny. And if you prayed that prayer with us this morning, I need to hear from you. Let me know. Let me know. For those who are seated this morning here, and for those that will be here, You've got the confidence. You've got the assurance that everything's all right. There's a song that starts off one of those old songs that said, if we never meet again this side of heaven. But then it goes on through the words, and I don't remember all the words of it. But in the course of it, it says, I'll meet you in the rapture some sweet day. I'll meet you in the rapture. We're scheduled to be back here Wednesday night. And I pray that we are. But if the rapture takes place, it's your pastor's heart and your pastor's Drive. It's what drives me. Is when the rapture takes place, I want to look over and wave at you and say, hey, how are you? We're going together to be with Jesus. We're going together to be with Jesus. I want to see you in the rapture. Hallelujah. Forevermore. I want to see you in the rapture. Let's remember a Wednesday night service. Seven o'clock, be here. We've been talking about spiritual gifts the last couple of weeks. I gave a homework assignment last Wednesday night. Read Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, and Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Do a brief and touch on these and then move forward in our Bible study. I hope to see you Wednesday night. But should the rapture take place, I pray to see you in the rapture. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand with it. Brother Danny, you dismiss it, please.